Hi everybody, so sorry we apologize for we are late, but we have uh, some problem. So now it's fixed and so we quickly uh, we start. So this is the fourth event of our series, New European Perspective. And so we are, uh, we discuss today about the digital revolution in the, the currencies. So what may happen to the euro in the digital currency revolution for the international monetary system? We question ourselves and we back today with our guest. Uh, we, um, we have uh, an article of the Bank on International Settlements that we, you can find in our text. And in, in this article, the board of the Bank on International Settlement has announced the expansion of the uh, innovation hub with the, the establishment of the new hub across uh, the Europe and North America in cooperation with the central bank. And so we ask if these are uh, premises for an upheaval in the international system of currency, because maybe we have a question of sovereignty that may arise because of different types of money and controls, paper, magnetic card, digital, the disappear of the money, maybe, as we know, and the use of the money that we can see now with new generation that seems something more like an exchange than a payment. So we discuss uh, with uh, Marie-Hélène Cagliol, President of the Laboratory and the Anticipation Politique and Publishing Director of Deep by Leap, Marianne Grand-Cormier, who is President of uh, Citizen Root, with Marco Moiso, that is Supervisor of Rural Movement in UK and Vice President of uh, Movement to Roosevelt. And we have uh, a video of uh, Massimo Amato, who is uh, uh, an economist and professor at uh, uh, Bocconi Economic School in Italy, in uh, Milan. So uh, we asked him to have a brief panorama on the subject of the article of the Bank of International Settlement and the possible stake. Then we will discuss about this theme. Maybe this time will be a little shorter. So we, we will get another time, second, maybe with uh, Massimo, maybe in live. We, we hope. So if we can send the video. No doubt uh, that the challenge set in motion by Bitcoin and blockchain against the money issued by central banks and by the banking system is primarily directed against the very structure of monetary relations, as far as they always rely on the trust placed in the issuer. We can put it in the form of a strategic either-or. Either trust necessarily needs centralized and vertical structures, which in turn involve a concentration of power and therefore are the possible source of large antisocial asymmetries, this is the current system as it stands, or we are now in a situation in which technology enables us to conceive and to establish horizontal arrangements, which are at least in principle compatible with the democratization of the economic and social relationships mediated by money. The underlying idea is that every third party is as such, it is as a mediator, a potential monopolist of the social power of the social relation it mediates. Cryptocurrencies, born with the aim of offering a peer-to-peer -peer pay payment system, have initially been seen as the realized utopia of a powerful democratizing tool. However, the utopia can turn into a dystopian world of a strong oligopolistic control. The case of Bitcoin is illuminating. Far from being the money of the people, it has become a system controlled by a narrow number of actors. The oligopoly of private banks has been substituted with another even more opaque oligopoly. The same is true also for private stablecoins, that is, cryptocurrencies backed by main official currencies or by safe assets denominated in those main official currencies, as in the case of the Libra project by Facebook. We are then in an opaque situation, the only merit of which is nevertheless that it sheds light on the opacity of the present institutional framework. To be sure, 
One cannot be but be surprised in reading this critique of Libra coming from a member of the executive board of the ECB, the uh, European Central Bank. I quote, history teaches us two things. The first, stateless money is an aberration with no solid, solid foundation in human experience. Second, money can only inspire trust and fulfill its key socioeconomic expansion if it is backed by an independent but accountable public institution with which itself enjoys public trust. End of quote. Please do not underestimate the contradiction in which the member of a central bank issuing a stateless money finds himself when he criticizes private stablecoins and cryptocurrencies. However, here we reach, I think, the critical point. Private stablecoins challenge, and in general, e-moneys uh, and uh, um, cryptocurrencies challenge the concept of sovereignty. Yes, but is there clarity on this concept? Maybe no, maybe not. Surely, it is a bit surprising to read in a paper of the IMF that Libra could be the occasion for imagining a sort of public-private partnership between central banks and private stablecoin issuers. So, in a sense, you have uh, central banks' uh, um, digital currencies in connection with uh, platforms that, uh, that manage uh, the payment system. However, is this idea of a partnership between a public issuer of money central banks, and private issuers and distributors of it really new. The answer is not at all. It is the same relation now in place between central banks and the private banking system. Transmission of monetary policy to the real economy was the rationale for the privilege historically granted to the private banking system as a whole of creating bank money backed by central bank money. However, with the great financial crisis, transmission of the central bank monetary policy has fundamentally stopped working. This is a highly problematic situation, since ensuring transmission of the, of the monetary policy was also the reason behind the privatization by banks of the pay payment system, which is a clearly a public good. But we can say, more broadly, that money itself is a public good, and that public goods need to be backed by a public guarantee. Any proposal of a new money must, must take into account this dimension. In this sense, if we need to think about new kinds of private-public partnerships, which are implied by the idea of a central bank digital, digital currencies, and this is the sense of the innovation promoted by the Bank of International Settlement, we must, we must think about them in the right way. What is the role of technology in this perspective? Concisely, to make this new arrangement possible. Going back to the suggestion of the uh, IMF FinTech note of July 2019 by Tobias Adrian and Tommaso Mancini Griffoli, we could imagine a redistribution of function between public and private as follows. On one hand, issuing on CBDC uh, central bank digital currencies by central banks. This implies that central banks regain control of the issuance of money and that uh, Central banks target the issuing directly to final users, that is, individuals, businesses, and non-governmental organizations. This, is a, this would be a, a real change, a disruptive change in the relationship uh, with uh, issuing central bank and uh, uh, commercial banks. On the other hand, we would have a creation of a central number of general, even global, payment platforms that could be, however, also be restricted and targeted to special purposes. They could be public, as a document of the German Bankenverband said in November 2019, private. In any case, they should rest on the control of the issuer and act only as payment services provided. These restrictions give room to the possibility of creating local community currency or special purpose currencies. This is very important in a situation of um, 
lack of, of liquidity in which uh, the, the COVID crisis uh, will bring us. In any case, this framework would separate banking activity proper for the, from the quasi-monopolistic management of the payment system by the banking system as a whole. Points to conclude, uh, Ivermon bluntly. First, the way money is, is the way it circulates. Stable coins are more stable than bitcoins, but to the extent that people prefer to hoard them precisely because they are stable. And, and in this sense, they are not coins. So we have to think to uh, some forms of electronic digital money, which is stable, but, but which is meant to circulate. But, uh, second point, the circulation of money has to do with communities. And re-articulating the vertical, until now bank-centered mode of transmission of monetary policy opens up the possibility to imagine really decentralized horizontal circuits embedded in a community to which those who manage the currencies are deemed to be accountable. Thank you. Bon, voilà. Donc, uh, we thank uh, a lot uh, Massimo for his contribution, very synthesized, very clear and <laughs> taking uh, very attention with very, very important points. Donc, I will give the, uh, the, uh, to, Ma to Marie-Hélène uh, the speech, because Gib uh, first uh, talked about this kind of... Uh, uh, subject that I think is very, very, very important, so we can uh, begin <laughs> to discuss, Marielen. Thanks. Okay, yes, thank you. Yes, indeed, we've been, uh, no, so, so um, I'm the president of a European think tank called LIP, Laboratoire Européen d'Anticipation Politique. Uh, uh, since 14 years, we've been following, not following, anticipating what we call the global systemic crisis, which is this crisis of transition between two systems, two paradigms, which are paradigms means everything, societal, economic, uh, uh, so, social, financial, technological, etc. Um, to another, to a new paradigm. This, we see things in the, in the following manner. Uh, to the 2008 crisis was the first visible signal of this transition crisis. And we consider today that 2020 is the year when we come out of this logic. What happened in between these, uh, these, during these 12 years? What are these two worlds uh, that we are shifting voila, for, away from, from and to? <laughs> um, so, in terms of the, the uh, international monetary system, it reflected uh, the geopolitical configuration, which since the Second World War, but even more so since the end of the Berlin Wall, since the end of the Union, Soviet Union, uh, was US-centered. US-centered globally. Huh? Before the fall of the Berlin Wall, the world was divided, of course, so US reigned over just part, half of the world. In 1989, the U.S. claimed a victory over, uh, over the Soviet Union, disregarding completely the role played by, by the Europeans. Uh, anyway, it became, the U.S. became the absolute global power uh, from that date, uh, with the, its currency uh, becoming the global uh, reserve currency for the whole global economy. Problem, the world after the Second World War was really US-centered because uh, voila, uh, China, Russia were on the other side of the wall, uh, India, Africa, South America were voila, not yet fully emerged, uh, developed economically. Europe had uh, committed suicide, so the US were really the only, uh, the only economy, a viable economy, helped Europe uh, getting out of the crisis, rebuilding, etc. But in 1989, 1991, uh, things had already started to change uh, a lot. Uh, Europe was back on track, and not uh, already for, for at least 20 years, uh, was back in, uh, 
uh, with a very flourishing economy, with a, a huge success in terms of uh, of peace, etc., of, uh, of governance, also of inventing new models of of supranational governance. Uh, and you have, of course, China, which is back. You have Russia, which is in crisis, but which is going to be back as a as a normal, so to say, power. So we have this multipolar world based on multipolar economy with voila, newcomers with huge economies behind. And we still have the dollar, which remains a national, which remains both a national currency and uh, this international, uh, this hub, this center, uh, this pillar of the, of the international monetary system. And this we have followed for 14 years, the crisis of the dollar, as because this pillar, the weight of this multipolar economy is too heavy for just one currency. So this in 2009, we wrote a, a big, an open letter to the leaders of the G20 of London in 2009, saying the, the financial crisis we have is a monetary crisis. So, so the dollar is not capable anymore of holding, of supporting the whole economy. So uh, we advocated at the time for the building of a global currency, which would be a basket on following a model close to the euro somehow, the basket of the main uh, international currencies, including the euro, the UN, the, the yen, the, the, uh, voilà, the emerging economies, uh, the, 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 the sterling pound, find the big, big currencies in a basket close to what the IMF has uh, with the DTS and the special drawing rights, special uh, the STRs, okay? And we followed what happened. Nothing happened, of course. Uh, as you know, and the crisis went on, more, uh, the, the banks, central banks had to fuel with all these QEs, uh, these liquidities to maintain the economic system in place, uh, knowing that we everybody knew it was unsustainable. Uh, but nevertheless, it managed to patch the system for another 14 years. Uh, and what do we have since three years? Three years. And nobody talks about it in the media, and so we are voilà, we are here. I'm quite happy to that Movimiento Roosevelt is interested in starting to raise this topic in the public because it's a huge revolution that's coming, uh, which is the emergence of di of central bank digital currencies, uh, uh, which in fact will is about digitalizing the international monetary system the, the but via these uh, national currencies uh, which are going to move to to voilà, being digitalized and that's not just you know it's it's a complete change of uh, of model in fact huh? so we have this this uh, emergence of course there's been bitcoins of course which have paved the way towards these uh, towards these moves so that's older than that but since three years uh, we know because we've been following that the IMF Madame Lagarde, who is now at the ECB, she was among the first that we spotted being really presenting the perspective of this uh, of this um, revolution, digital revolution of the of of currencies. Uh, um, so that was three years, two years ago, at least two years ago, that we spotted uh, uh, this uh, speech from uh, Madame Lagarde. Uh, based on the IMF about a huge uh, shift coming up in, no, based on this revolution of the digitalization of, of currency, which is not, as I say, I mean, one of the consequences, for instance, is the, a complete change in the role of private banks, which Massimo highlights too. There, uh, the uh, digital currency will disintermediate the relation between the issuer, the central banks, and the user, the people and the companies and the economy. So there's no more need, in fact, for banks. So banks will have to change role. That's a fact. And that's why it's so difficult to implement this change. And that's why somehow the COVID crisis, the huge economic and financial and monetary crisis that will go, that will be come in the aftermath of the COVID crisis is providing for the absolute chaotic situation where, of course, the, the resorting to these tools will, will of course, become uh, obvious. So that's why we can anticipate at least that in 2021, we will start seeing these solutions come up. Uh, um, uh, from everywhere. Huh? So 
just uh, uh, the way we see it, we are not specialists and we need to work with people who are specialists. I'm glad you brought Mr. Massimo uh, in the discussion because there are people who know better how this works. Uh, but uh, we try as citizens to understand what's coming ahead. And we understood the following, that Libra might provide the sort of global infrastructure. I'm not saying Libra, but something that will be uh, private, public, based on Libra, but involving also now the, as you said, the BIS, which is connecting central banks from all over the world together into this innovation dynamic. Uh, so providing the, the infrastructure, which is what we call the aircraft carrier, on which you have two, three different categories, as we see it today, of currents, digital currencies emerging. The, the an, um, a second level, of our, uh, the next level underneath this, this global level is the supranational currencies. We have uh, the Ayer, the Aber, Aber, I think, which is a, a currency which is being developed by Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Emirates, uh, uh, Emirates State, uh, the EUA, <laughs> the Emirates, uh, um, are developing a common currency which is meant to, which is not retail currency. It's not meant to be in the pockets of people. It's meant to facilitate to be a, 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 a payment system. It's a currency and a payment system together and will facilitate uh, trade exchanges between these, these two countries. And of course, it certainly has the, the ambition of becoming a currency for the whole region. Huh? That's uh, pretty sure. You have China, which has just launched uh, the project of a supranational currency between them, China, between Japan, South Korea, and Hong Kong. So they are trying; they are starting to work on the concept of a, a, a common currency that will help uh, increase uh, trade exchanges in this region. A pan a pan Asian currency in this case. And interestingly, and that's where there is uh, things to say about the future of the euro. Interestingly, we consider today that the euro is also in that category which means that uh, it's a supranational currency and it is not for retail yet. The way the French are currently developing uh, the currency, it is only interbank or well, uh, inter well, uh, business, uh, trans-border business trade uh, meant for. And apparently it's not yet. In, know, is it because it's going to be the next step that it's going to come in our pockets too? Or, and that's where it's an interesting question that we are raising currently, would, would it be that the euro belongs to the supranational currency and that we could see the emergence or the rebirth of more national-based currencies, which would be completely tied into this euro, but which would nevertheless, and blockchain enables to have this agility, that each cent national central bank in the, in the eurozone would somehow emit, issue its own current digital currency in a way that is coordinated, but it's with more uh, space for their own uh, monet uh, national monetary uh, interests and, and policies. That's something, because, because then we would have, there is this next category, which is what uh, Massimo calls officially the central uh, bank uh, digital currencies. Uh, which therefore are really connected to nation, national banks, uh, central banks this time. Uh, and these national central banks, you have, of course, uh, China, which is uh, working on, on its E yuan, which is one of the, uh, the, 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 the very the most advanced ones. You have uh, Sweden, which is working on its E krona. So you see, you have a whole set of currencies. Um, the, the Turkish are beginning to work on the, an E lira, uh, etc. So you have a whole set of countries, of course, with their central banks who are issuing their, their digital currency. And we wouldn't be surprised that the next step for Europe, for the Eurozone, would be to actually have the national central banks issuing their digital currencies in the name, for instance, it could be called the Euro Lira, the Euro Franc, the Euro Mark, maybe, huh? or something like that. Bon, so that's a very interesting question. In any case, uh, it brings us to a perspective of reform of the euro. You know, everybody's aware how much the euro has been tested in this crisis, in this 14-year crisis, uh, um, has been tested and has revealed flaws, uh, uh, which were namely due to the fact that it was too much of a, a single currency instead of a common currency. 
the fact that it was single meant that it was a block currency that disregarded the differences between countries and economies, etc. And maybe with the digital euro, we could have a chance, uh, a possibility. We certainly will have this possibility to have a tool which is more flexible, more agile, which is both highly coordinated with artificial intelligence, etc., naturally, or not naturally, artificially um, uh, uh, balancing uh, uh, interest rates, or not interest rates, but uh, exchange rates, etc., for instance, in a very smooth and unhuman way, but based on national currencies, in fact, again, uh, uh, tied together, which would be a very, very uh, interesting model very close to probably what the European Union was meant for at the origin, uh, which was a European community, I remind you, which was meant to, to, to be very uh, uh, protective of uh, diversity. And there's been in the past 30 years uh, something that took us away from this notion of diversity with a, a longing for centralization, etc., which made the project fail partly, and that's one of the reasons. And there is today, we think, a trend to go back to the original notion of this common, uh, of this European community, which is to say, let's coordinate, let's share, let's put in common things, uh, but let's remain where we are and, and just make sure that we work together and not to make war <laughs> against each other. So that's the kind of perspective we have, but there's so much to say about this uh, revolution, digital revolution for Europe and for the world. Uh, I, mean, I forgot the last uh, scale, the, 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 the underneath scale, which is the cryptocurrencies, uh, which we would remain, we think, but we are not sure, which could remain like uh, some, you know, some uh, equivalent to what the gold was playing uh, or cash was playing in the former system, a rather anonymous and more flexible with, uh, voila, uh, but, but, being at the back, at the, at the foundation of the whole edifice of uh, uh, digital currencies, in fact, of digital monetary system. But we are not completely sure that the cryptos will remain. They might be completely regulated, but they might be integrated in the edif edifice. But this is just an introduction. It's been maybe a little longer. Uh, I would just like to finish on, I was referring to this 2009 open letter that we wrote saying that there was a need for a change of the, in the international monetary system and the integration of new currencies. In 2019, last year, in August, uh, Mark Carney, Mark Carney, the head of the, e, the Bank of England, uh, said exactly the same thing. It took 10 years, therefore, between the awareness that there was a need to change international monetary system and this official uh, message sent by well, uh, some, someone highly important, uh, prominent uh, in the international uh, financial and monetary system, Mark Carney, saying the dollar cannot bear the whole global economy. We need to change. And by the fact that this kind of person could say something like that means clearly that they have their solutions ready and that they know that we can't go any further with the old system. And therefore, somehow, the COVID crisis is really providing the perfect conditions to whom? Alors, perfect doesn't mean uh, harmless, <laughs> because there's going to be a transition. The final transition phase is, uh, could be really tough. Uh, but at least we tend to hope that there are solutions and that these solutions, which are based on these digital currencies, are also prone to an entire digitalization of society, which, of course, we think is already there, but we've seen nothing in terms of risks, but also in terms of pot pot potential for very uh, modern and smooth and, and flowing, uh, where, where money could flow a lot, a lot further than it is actually. So a lot of hope also lies in these new tools. Uh, and that's why this topic is, a very, is both a very important topic for citizens, uh, but citizens must be very, very responsible. And instead of doing what they tend to do these days, which is always rejecting, is to should try to see what's in it for them, if they are there, if they understand, if they see also the positive aspects. And democracy, as Massimo said in it, uh, e-democracy, the future of our democracies, lies somehow, indeed, as Massimo said, I think, in this revolution. Thank you. Maria. Ah, okay. Okay. So thank you, Maria Elena. Very, very interesting connecting what said Massimo. So Marianne, if you want to tell yes. us. Yes. 
Hello, uh, so I am the president of Citizen Suit and also vice president of the Association of uh, the Friends of Hong Kong Um I just want to, to, I will be very short, uh, just to speak about uh, three points uh, that were raised by Massimo and by Marie Hélène also. The first one was about democratization. Uh, virtual, virtual uh, money currency and uh, e currencies, etc., um, will, uh, as Massimo explained, it be on a horizontal level, um, and this is one of the um, uh, prerequisite of um, of uh, of this uh, introduction of such uh, monies. Um, we are actually uh, witnessing uh, that. Uh, uh, with the COVID crisis, for example, that the that the fiat money, the the, the fusion money, uh, is perhaps uh, uh, very um, uh, has is knowing very difficult difficult times, and that everything uh, and all the payments made are today mostly uh, done uh, virtually by credit cards or on on internet. And the question is. Um, uh, what kind of purse we have? Do we have the money in the pocket or in which pocket do we have this money? And for me, actually, today we have this money in our cell phone or on our computer. And uh, we have, everyone has virtual wallet. Uh, and, uh, and this is something very important to keep in mind. Um, the second point is that blockchain is not only for virtual money, but for... Um, uh, for um, a range of different uh, of different kind of operations uh, to send money to send uh, virtually money to to uh, to pay credits to pay um, etc. Uh, but also exchanges and um, and this is um, this is something very new in the, these last times uh, that uh, we are no more paying the things so the money has perhaps no more any kind of value but we are exchanging and we are swapping we are bartering um, if you buy something on internet uh, then you can send it back and you exchange it with something else and uh, and uh, you have uh, i don't know some different conditions to 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 send it back but it's possible today so what is the value of the money today and what would be the value of e-money of virtual money uh, the second point was about sovereignty of the nation states. As Marie Hélène said, we are witnessing also on one side the raise of a virtual euro, of a digital euro, but on the other side also some um, the raise, uh, raising up of national digital monies, like the e-krona, Marie Hélène said it, but also uh, in France, uh, for example, uh, e-euro, but Used only for uh, a specific um, uh, for specific uh, private partners and on national level. So this is really something uh, something new. We have this. Uh, we have the euro becoming more and more digital, or we have the the, the, uh, the project of this uh, digital euro. And on those on the same side, we have the uh, national central banks working on national virtual monies or virtual euros and also uh, and then this was the third point the fourth point was about the um, uh, the different the democratization also and uh, at end uh, for the um, international organization like the or European institutions uh, which is very important they are really working on um, uh, to connect directly with the citizens, to connect the money directly to the citizens. And uh, you have uh, uh, different uh, declarations of like Yves Mersch from the BCE, from the European Central Bank, or like Benoit Curé, or like Christine Lagarde, she is the president of the Central Bank, who really are mentioning any time, every time, the link, the necess necessary link, direct link to the citizens and not only to the institutions or to the organization, but really on a horizontal way. So that was it. Thank you.
so thanks um, Marianna so Marco what we can say uh, okay so what There can we say uh, a lot of it has been said on a very very uh, tough topic to talk about um so we should remember that money never had any intrinsic value uh, the value the value on, the, on its people who it is the people who attribute money a specific value depending on rules that are regulated by financial agreements financial international agreements what marianne rightly said is that the fact that money do not have an intrinsic value is now becoming more and more evident to everyone around the world money do not have value they are means for an exchange anyway now um, as massimo was saying uh, there has been opacity in the current way that man money was issued issued and i would say that the opacity um comes mainly from the fact that um especially starting from the 90s we started taking away uh, the monetary um, policies from national governments and we started to a process of privatization of central banks uh, and also so, so uh, the way that currencies have been uh, issued were, were, were had to pass through private banks so it made a lot of it, it definitely started especially starting from the money it definitely definitely helped the financial system uh create an, an enormous growth of money that was not linked to the real economy but at the same problem forced the government to um pay interest on the money that were needed to pay for everything there is you know we know that there is a a direct a direct relationship across the world between uh public debt and infrastructure development for example and well-being uh, unfortunately we have been paying interest governments have been paying interest to financial institutions in italy in europe the EU, the euro also had two other problems uh, compared to what maryland said that there was a problem because of the, how fixed it was and the fixed change, exchange but also there was no legislative power ex again deciding what the monetary policies were uh, that it wasn't an elective uh, uh, there wasn't an, the, the ecb's independent but also we could not um, um, directly finance markets, uh, governments, and therefore pump money into the real economy. We had to go through the financial markets in order to find to find to found uh, public expenditure. So now we are talking about a new uh, way of also issuing money. And I think that Massimo said very clearly. Um, uh, pointed out very clearly the problem around sovereignty. Uh, and by sovereignty, I mean two things. Working in the, according to the will of people, and two, uh, uh, issuing money in the interest of people, uh, rather than in the interest of big financial institutions. So when we talk about anything that's new, digital, there is sometimes there is a lot of hype for something that's new, and usually there is a lot of people that are opposing whatever whatever is actually new. Usually there is a polarization between supporters or whatever is new and people who oppose whatever is new. So I think that when we evaluate uh, new methodologies, new technologies, uh, when, we, when we evaluate even historical uh, uh, happenings like the industrial revolution, the digital revolution, uh, the automat automatization revolution that we're going through, we, we, we just need to keep an open mind and understand what are the principles that need to be followed. Um, in this instance, I think that we need to, first of all, establish once and for all that money, the amount, the, the, the amount of money that circulates, that shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't ever be limited, like in the case of um, the bitcoins. So the, the amount of money do not grow on trees. There isn't any field of money. They are not limited in nature. You can have as, mu as much money as the economy requires. 
So we, we just need to bear in mind that the, the amount of money that should not be limited. The second point is that the management of money at the top level, even though then we have artificial intelligence, um, administrating, managing the, uh, uh, managing from an administration point of view, the transaction, the, uh, the uh, adaptation of the dif between the different uh, maybe currencies that uh, Mar Marielan was talking about, I think that it's important that governments still retain the, con the control of how much money is pumped in the into the economy, uh, depending on the needs of specific economies, whether they're uh, based on a supranational level or a national level. The, the question when you create an international network is who then decides how much money is available to each country <laughs> and how it's calculated, who assesses what the needs are, uh, what the potentials of an economy are, and, and, and whether they're elected power that work in the interest of people, as I was saying, or whether they are uh, um, uh, uh, algorithms that are just looking at what um, Von Hayek said, the scientist approach. approach. So they're, they're not looking at managing the currency based on the needs of the people, but they're just crunching equations that maybe are, do not work in the interest of people. So that's quite in, important. The other thing to avoid, in my opinion, is to create a, 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 um, a, a plain competitive field between economies. I'm for globalization, for the globalization, but the globalization that we have seen now is uh, the wrong type of globalization because we have um, created a competitive field where uh countries with uh, a very developed welfare system with very developed uh, protections for the workforce started competing with economies that had um, lower value in in nations and were adopted in nations where no social rights so there should be still some level of um how can i say uh, governance public governance over what the transactions are, from my point of view, um, and 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 it should be uh, and that should be therefore handled in the interest of the, of the people rather than the financial institution. And this could be a potential because if we if we are financing public government uh, through private financial institutions that take money that are issued from cent central banks and then give those money to the governments by paying an interest, that's, we are just paying interest to financial institutions that should have, could not, we could get rid of. But at the same time, we need to, we, we need to make sure that there are still democratic, there is still a democratic process in place. Um, and also the, the other thing is that I've always, I, I, am, I am against, uh, in principles, but that can be discussed, about taking, away paper money from people because that that, that there, there is an implication of a big threat uh, like in Greece when they close the ATMs and the automatic machines people should always be in control of their money so if we give this money to the people because they do not need any bank there shouldn't be anybody allowed to switch off the system basically and taking any money off but I guess this is one of the things that it's already been talked about in terms of that this risk would not be there. Um, the, and the last thing is, um, I wonder how we can create a global system in, the, in a political context where the relationship between the Western world and Asia are getting more and more complicated and more and more tense, especially between the US and China. And we need to rethink uh, how to globalize the, uh, the world in such a way that um, uh, it, 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 we, we need to, we need the world to evolve from both an economical point of view and a political point of view, and these two things very often go hand in hand. So uh, my, my my concern is all uh, is all about um, how we can make this transition to a, a global system, global currency, um, go hand in hand with the development of. 
what really matters in life, which is not money. Money, as, as Marianne was saying, is a mean to an end. So we need to keep our focus on what we need to achieve from a social standpoint and make sure that whatever monetary system we create, if it's global, it's shared with also with countries that share a political, a, a, a social political direction. Um, and I'm quite scared nowadays, to be honest, even with what, what's happening with Huawei, 5G, and multinationals that are very much controlled by national governments. In the Western world, we are used by, to corporations that are somewhat uh, independent from governments. In other parts of the world, that's not the case. Aramco is strictly linked to the royal family, to the royal Saudi Arabian family. Huawei is strictly linked with um, uh, uh, the China's government. So we need to be careful in terms of how we proceed. The fact that there are some very high level, top people, level people thinking about doing things doesn't mean that people should have, shouldn't have a say on how things are done and what the process is to get to the desired point. I, I'm just, just concerned about the, the fact that money is a means to an end. And, and if we start globalizing, um, creating some global network, uh, it should never be private and should always follow some principles and values that concern the human sphere and not the financial sphere. Okay, thank you. So if you don't have something to say over, I I can close this video if you want. Marianne, Marielena, are you okay? Because we begin late, so it's late. And I think that this is important panoramic that we have, beginning with Massimo and then with Marielen, Marianne and Marco, I think that uh, we can resign that we must continue with this subject because, uh, as we said, uh, it's an important stake uh, for the society. It depends uh, uh, many, many things. So citizens must take in hand this subject, not leave. They have to uh, appropriate <laughs> of this subject and so as a movement Roosevelt and the Elite Citizen Route, our, our uh, 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 direction is clearly to uh, allow people to take in hands this subject. So I think that we can continue. Marielle wanted to add something, I think. Ah, we oui, oui, okay. Yeah, maybe just one very short concluding remarks with regards to what Marco was saying and that uh, all the flaws that you potentially see as a uh, as um, being connected to this digital currency, in fact, belong to the world before. If you look at it, I mean, the, you, you even quoted the fact that ATMs can be cut by governments. So there is more sovereignty, there is more individual sovereignty, there is more circulation, there is more uh, of, the, of money everywhere. I mean, uh, for instance, in Africa, there is, you were right when you were saying that the fiat currency uh, uh, system, uh, there is there is something material about it which makes it seldom which makes it uh well so there is those who have it and those who don't have it even if they have an, an activity uh, and it should just money a good currency system is just meant to reflect the reality of an activity and here with the with the digitalization of of, uh, of currencies uh, you can have people at the very you know in in the countryside of africa who have an activity and who have a mobile phone and who therefore can start, as Marianne was saying, bartering through this measure system. It, you know, somehow with the digitalization of monetary system, we have something that takes us away from this uh, hoarding thing, from capitalism somehow, I think. Of course, I'm not naive completely. There will be huge interests who are going to try to, uh, to make the most of this, but there is something really with digital currencies, uh, which is about, uh, uh about about money as uh as something that is undivided that undividable that is uh those who hold it and those who don't should disappear and as you say there is a when we say that central banks can issue the currency that is required to reflect the actual economy uh but uh, you are solving lots of the problems that you described. And also the fact that it's global. It's not global. It's not a global currency. It's a global infrastructure. Like internet is, an, is a global infrastructure. But then on this aircraft carrier, 
you have a lot of sovereignty, whether it is na national sovereignty or, and that's something we've already written about in the GIBA, there is also not about currencies, but about, so I don't know what was the topic, but about, uh, about individual sovereignty. The fact that this money, uh, digital money, you know, the, the, the kind of money we have on our bank accounts today is just a reflection of something that we don't hold. It's just a mirror. Uh, if with digital currencies, it will be really on our purses, on our digital purses. And we can manage these digital purses, uh, uh, um, which might have, uh, I don't know exactly, I'm mean, here I'm going into technicalities that I don't completely handle, but I'm sure that de facto our bank accounts will be on our mobile phones and that there's a lot of services yeah, that are not going to be, huh? come on. They are already on our mobile phones. They are phone. already, but we can, all, yeah. the, all the services that they used to provide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not against the, as I said, I was just looking at principles. The ATM no, is no, that. The, the thing <laughs> is that there is this tendency to project flaws uh, uh, that in fact belong to the old system. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about fact, it. The new you're system could solve lots of these flaws, even if it doesn't mean we need to be naive and we, we need to be... Uh, what are we? But, but, but absolutely, let's discuss further what I meant with the example yeah. with the ATM, is that the ATM belongs to the old system. We're talking about digital money and not paper money. But if I send you an update of your phone, I can shut it down. I can shut down an app. So we, we need to think about the fact that the, 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 the infrastructure that you were saying should not be, it shouldn't be possible to ever shut down what, what belongs to the people in the same form as you cannot uh, uh, burn paper that people keep under the mattress. The yeah, that's right. why it's a whole, it's a whole, uh, it, it, re, it will compel us to reinvent democracy, governance, etc., it will, and it's a reverted like uh, Uber uh, did. Huh? I mean, it will completely revert logic, current logics, and there will be a role yes. for the national levels, the city levels, the global levels, etc. There will be a role, but it will be roles of coordination based on the fact uh, that it's the people who will really. I think there is this possibility. Of course, I know there will be interest. So you're right who will try to keep some kind of power, but it's going to be quite irresistible, the trend of having this uh, uh, um, trickling down of, uh, you know, something that was not in our hands. You know, it's like it's like with uh, with uh, uh, with um, tracking of uh, this data thing, you know, we don't want our data to be, we, uh, you know, about the, the covid related uh, tracking systems and everybody's saying oh i don't want to my data to be taken away from me or to be stolen from me but you've never had any data the data is in google it's not in anywhere you know so so well uh, let's look at things more positively think see that there is a lot for us uh, uh, to to gain back uh, and with uh, these um these levels of, of governance becoming mostly coordinators, legislators, uh, and but serving serving us, and and that's what well, uh, at the service of the population. So it could be a very very democratic system. Yeah, and just what I want to add one thing about um, uh, virtual money because um, there is a, a huge debate between uh, different uh, European people from uh, south or from uh, from germany for example or nor north of europe who have who are using very very much cash money and um, they don't use uh, credit cards because it's too expensive uh, for the uh, for the grocers etc but in france for example when i go and and when i want to go and buy uh, my baguette my baker refuse cash so, so I think with digital digitalization on European level, with this uh, trans-European digitalization, it will also um, uh, reorganize, reorganize the different the different uh, operations because it's going through new technologies. So there is no reason to have uh, the different operators taking different levels of money. Or by is the needs of societies, needs of people who is the first to start and then 
to decline the rest. But uh, for the moment, <laughs> it's a very complex. Uh, no, uh, when Maria Ren was talking about the development of this thing and the potential it had, it reminded me a bit of the European Union. What we had in mind and what they had in mind. <laughs> no, 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 no. How, I hope that we stay on track and we define what the boundary. Maybe this conversation can help us define the boundary of what it should look like. No, no, the, the, it's not what we had in mind and what they had in mind. I mean, there's uh, even for Europe. I mean, it's what Europe had to go through in terms of imposing itself in the world that was changing and that it was not really, well, and with the influence of. Uh, but the sponsor, the former sponsor, the American uh, mentor who suddenly went berserk uh, once the, the wall fell and we had to untangle ourselves from, uh, from a gone berserk uh, mentor, berserk ben mentor. So, I, you know, I, of course there are, you know, when a, when a system dysfunctions, that's when you have, uh, you know, everybody trying to make the most of a dysfunctioning system. But originally, each system is meant to be operational. I would say let's trust a little bit more what uh, what uh, the elites are doing. They are, <laughs> um, uh, and of course, you're right, Marco. There are people ambushed everywhere, trying to to see how they will be remain the big uh, the big bosses into that into that system. And that's why any system has to be constantly updated, renewed, changed completely. Because all the baddies, let's call them like this, uh, are there in bush uh, trying to see how they will ruin the new beautiful system that you've created. Yeah. That's a fact. No. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I agree yeah, with yes. that. Absolutely. That's why, that's, why, that's why we were always talking about the principles uh, and then yeah. how it's done. And, uh, let's, you know. and you, but you're right that the question is to think about the resilience. How, what are, what are we going to put into that machine so that it's is more resilient to what uh, to what the, we were just describing the vultures coming all over and, and destroying your beautiful machine <laughs> i think uh, marianne should go uh, okay. you i don't know if, if you want we can close we can close it, it. We can close it. it's been an hour yeah, I think yeah, yes close, yes it's been an hour because it was very interesting as always but we should come me we will continue uh, after the after the summer, because this subject is very very important. I think that the society is at a bifurcation. We have to choose <laughs> where we want to go, and we must be aware, very very aware, and not leave, <laughs> not the mainstream, or not add uh, or only person against. No, there is another way, and the important is to talk about and take the subject with to share and discuss. So I thank you very much, very, very, very Bye -bye. much. And I, I propose to have Massimo and Nino also. Yes, our of course. Be very interesting. Time. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very bye -bye. much. Thank, thank you, lot. everyone. Have, have, thank a, have you. a good summer break. Yeah, yeah, same for you. Have a nice break. Thank you. Have a nice break. Yes. Bye. 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 Have a nice bye -bye. summer. Bye -bye.